Father, thank you so much for this time when we get to open up your word. I pray you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us. I thank you for the word of God. We pray that you'd change us as we embrace it and as we study your word. Have your way in our lives. I thank you for it, Lord. Amen. God spoke to his people in the past. God still speaks today. He is the God who speaks. Jesus is the word. We're given the word. God desires to communicate with his people, and I'm very grateful for that. Contained within the 66 books of the Bible, there's this section of scripture that runs from Isaiah through Malachi that's called the book of the prophets or prophets. In the Old Testament, you had the law, the prophets, and we don't spend a lot of time often looking at these, but uh, once you get past Song of Solomon, you hit this big book called Isaiah, and it's one of the major prophets. There's major and minor prophets is how they separate these. The major ones are Isaiah and Jeremiah, including his Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel, and the, and the rest of them are called minor, and, and it has nothing to do with the content. It has everything to do with the length. And so the longer ones are up front, and they call them the major. Uh, Isaiah is the second most quoted book in the New Testament. Which one's the first? This is a test. Psalms Psalms is correct. Deuteronomy was close, but Psalms is the correct one. And probably because of length, but also the wonderful material that's in both of them. And so this book is quoted all the time in the New Testament. It is full of, of wonderful pictures. You go, wow, man, do you really want to go through Isaiah? Yeah, it's full of, you know, fencing and pirates and torture, and it's got <laughs> giants and revenge and true love. And Okay, maybe it doesn't have pirates, but it's got all the other stuff in there. And, and for those of you that don't know that quote, talk to Mr. Williams. One of the things that's interesting to me is the book of Isaiah, uh, they had a copy of it that they based their translations on and so forth, and then they found these Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of us have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was this phenomenal find of of, uh, books that that a shepherd boy or somebody uh, discovered in this cave, and they found this this discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found an entire 66 chapters of Isaiah that was a thousand years older than the one that they had. And so there was a little bit of fear and intrepidation saying, okay, how different is this going to be from the one that we're using and so forth? And as it turns out, it was a perfect copy other than normal trans- a little bit of spelling and language changes that happen normally over the, over the course of 10 centuries. But as I read that and thought about that, I thought, what a phenomenal gift we have in the Word of God. There were faithful men and I don't know if women did that or not, but at least faithful men that copied, laboriously copied Isaiah's words for century after century after century to assure us that what we're reading is really what was written. And that's throughout the scripture. It's it's wonderful. We know from verse 1 that Isaiah primarily spoke to uh, four different kings. He spoke for over about 50 years. He, He was focused in Jerusalem mostly, Judah speaking to the southern kingdom, and, and that he, uh, his name, we don't know a whole lot about the guy, but his name means Yahweh save or, or saves or God saves or a lot of different ways that, that it's translated, but basically the emphasis is on salvation. And scholars and, and guys who care about such things fuss and fight about all sorts of things over the book of Isaiah. The truth is we don't know a whole lot about Isaiah. We know what's given to us in the scripture. He's the one who says he wrote it. We know he was married to a prophetess. We know he had a couple of kids at least. We know he probably came uh, as out of the service of one of the kings, Uzziah there, and that he may be the guy who was sawn in two, that Hebrews talks about Manasseh, who, uh, who wasn't a real nice guy in the early days of his life. And so we don't know a whole lot about him. And, and guys fuss and fight about how many Isaiahs were there. You know, the scripture says there was one. And, and the reason they do that is because the book breaks into like three or four pretty distinct parts. The first 39 chapters are written in one fashion. 40 through 55 had kind of a different focus, a different emphasis. 56 through 66, yet a different focus. As if God couldn't speak to one person to write on three different segments or topics. And, and the scholars of the day particularly the ones that don't believe in any kind of divine intervention, say it couldn't possibly be one guy. 
It's Isaiah. He wrote it. I believe that. And they let other people fuss about things they can't possibly know. But you'll, you'll find some major themes as you go through Isaiah. And we're not going to go through this verse by verse, but we are going to look at some, some uh, interesting teachings as we go through this time together. But there's a lot of major themes that run through it. He uses this phrase, the Holy One of Israel, repeatedly throughout the book. His emphasis is on the holiness of God. He talks about sin. He talks about judgment. One of the issues that the prophets all wrote about, but Isaiah in particular, uh, and this would be good for us to think about, is that God is using a wicked nation to judge a wicked people. And they were freaking out over this, as they all were in the prophets. They're saying, God, how can you use somebody like Assyria that is horrible to come in and judge us? And God says, I'll use who I want to use to get my people where I want them to be. And so that theme runs through the back of the book is this judgment of God because Israel has messed up and Judah, the kingdom was split there and we'll talk more about that. But salvation runs through the book. Servanthood runs through the book. The coming Messiah runs through the book. It's a good book. There is so much good, deep teaching in the book of Isaiah. I hope you will be challenged to study it as we go through um, this study together. Now, I like this quote because his emphasis is on holiness. And he says, hanging around with the holy is risky business. Holy ground is dangerous ground. (laughs) Every time God shows up, our God is a consuming fire, right? And sometimes we're so glib in the way we treat our God. And I understand Abba Father and and that emphasis. But we don't want to forget the other emphasis either, that our God is holy. And when we we, we sing songs like, mold me on the potter's wheel, Man, I don't sing that with as much zeal as I used to. Because you know what happens on the potter's wheel? Have you ever watched somebody make? I mean, it, it just, that's ugly. <laughs> Sometimes it can really be ugly. You know, and let's start again. Have your way, Lord. But anyway, what was going on in the backdrop of this is that Israel was in a major decline. They were the envy of the world. If you remember during the David and and Solomon reign, it was the golden era of Israel. And God said, if you continue walking with me, I will bless you and make you the envy of the world. And we know what happens is they they split. But they always thought that God was going to do that for them again. They always thought that they were going to get back to that golden age. And it didn't happen. It happens in in the church, but... What's going on around them is Assyria and then Babylon, are, they're taking over the world. <laughs> they're coming down, it, it's this horde of people coming down that's licking everybody up, every nation up that's in its way. And as you read through the Old Testament, you'll run into this all the time, that they're trying to figure out how do we deal with Assyria. They were coming down and they were going to conquer us. And they're saying, God, you are the sovereign God of the world. You established us. You gave us dominion over everything. And we can't do anything to stop this enemy coming in. And God's saying, you're absolutely right, because I told you in the curses of the covenant that you have violated, this is what's going to happen to you. And they needed to be reminded of that, and Isaiah does a very good job of doing that. We do know that Israel was destroyed. The kingdom split after Solomon, and we know Israel was north and Judah was south, and that Israel continued down the path of rebellion and never had a godly king until they finally were destroyed, carried away in 722 Judah would follow shortly after Isaiah gets done with his ministry. There's a little reprieve here and there, but they end up being destroyed as well with uh, the Babylonians coming in to do it. So why did it happen? Well, we just finished this series on the blood covenant. God very clearly laid out for them, this is what I want you to do. This is my law. These are my guidelines. If you follow this, I will bless you. If you don't follow these things... I'm going to redeem you, but boy, it's going to be painful. <laughs> and it was. They were end up being defeated and carried away and so forth. That's Isaiah's message. Prophets were not a popular bunch, as you may have imagined. They're standing and proclaiming the sin of a nation or a king or whoever it is, and they're looking them straight in the eye and say, you have sinned, and you've blown it, and you need to repent. And many times they were not well received. And you'll see this in some of the things Isaiah says. He is very clear, and yet he wasn't received real well. So we know from the first verse that Isaiah saw a vision from heaven. We know from Isaiah 6 or 5 or whichever one it is where he sees this glorious picture of God on his throne. And we'll get to that. But he is speaking the word of the Lord during these kings. 
He's got these four kings and he's going to talk about it. The opening scene is much like a courtroom drama that you would imagine, at least I would imagine. You've got this picture, and it's based in the law, if you, if you think about it. Uh, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. God picked Abraham, remember this? And he said, I will be a father to you. And I'm going to give you all these sons. And, and the children have rebelled. Deuteronomy 21, there's this strange discussion in there about that if you have a grown son who refuses to repent, who refuses to bow his knee to the covenant, you're supposed to take him before the leaders of the, of the council. And if he refuses to repent, they stone him. <laughs> you tie that in with, with, with uh, Proverbs 19.18, one of the verses that I never really related to till I had children. It said, don't desire the death of your son. I joke about that. Obviously, I didn't want to kill him. But boy, there were times when I'm going, I didn't even know I had a temper until I had children. You know, and, and they brought out the, this flesh that was in there buried deeply. But in this case, God's saying, I brought up children and they've rebelled against me. His father's heart is being broken. He goes on, he says, the oxen owes its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. They don't understand everything I've done for them. They don't get it. What a scary sentence. I do not want this said about me. <laughs> Jeff doesn't know. He doesn't understand. God have mercy. I pray that would not be said about any of us in here. It's a scary, scary sentence. And, and in this courtroom drama, Isaiah is full of poetry. It, it, there's very little prose in it, but it's full of a lot of, of visual images of what's going on. And I can just see you know, Isaiah standing before the Lord. He gets his vision from heaven of what's going on, and God is laying out his case against Israel. You don't understand why you're under judgment? Let me explain it to you. Here it comes. A sinful nation, a people uh, laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They've forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, and they are utterly estranged. It is clear that they have rejected the Lord. Century after century after century, they continue. God sends them judges and He sends them kings and He sends them prophets, and they say, I don't want it. I don't want your ways, O God. And it's just generation of a mess. They've forsaken the Lord. They've despised the Holy One. It goes beyond saying, I don't want to just do, you know, don't want to do what you're telling me to do. I don't like you. I hate you. That's just not a good place to be in relation to your covenant father. The facts are very clear. Israel has rejected God. And yet, they continue practicing the outward religious observances. And it drives God crazy, if I could say that. It, 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 he, he is, hypocrisy does not sit well with the King of kings and Lord of lords. What we are on the outside is supposed to match what we are on the inside. They weren't doing that. It becomes very obvious as, as you read through the next few verses. He says, why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land, and it is desolate and overthrown by foreigners. And the daughters of Zion are left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom. And become like Gomorrah. <laughs> God's saying, look, guys, do you not see what's going on here? You're struck down. Your body's falling apart. There's wounds that can't be healed. Your cities are destroyed. And yet they're saying, all is well. All is good. Everything's peachy. And God's saying, you're not getting it. My people do not understand. Can't you understand where your rebellion has led you? Can you not understand that your choices take you somewhere? And I'm reading this and I'm going, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Do we understand where our choices take us? Do we understand the consequences of our actions? I pray we would. This isn't just written to them. It's for our instruction, for our encouragement. Our choices matter. The decisions we make will take us somewhere. Where are we going? Where are we heading? He goes on, and this is going to make Isaiah really popular. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. 
Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. (laughs) What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wow. Do we wonder? I I don't wonder why guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah and the prophets were not exactly well loved. He's he's standing and talking in, in the realm of authority and he's saying things like this. You guys are bringing in your burnt offerings. They're vain. They're worthless. I can't endure your sacred assemblies. They're all getting together and they're doing their God thing while their hearts are totally corrupt, totally wicked, serving idols, living a double life, and they're doing their external thing. And God says, I hate your feasts. Can you imagine? Can you get a picture of Isaiah doing this and the king going, oh, thanks, Isaiah. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for your opinion, He's saying, I hate your feasts. I'm weary and I'll hide my eyes from you. And and when you pray, I'm not even going to listen to you anymore. (laughs) Man, have mercy. These are very strong words from the Holy One. I I don't want to hear this. Would you like to hear this? I don't don't want to hear this. Fortunately, it goes on and he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the veil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. You know, what we do is very important. And what we do is supposed to match what we say, right? We walk the walk. We walk the talk. So many times what God was upset with is he said, you are talking the things that make a good game. You're talking religion. You're talking following me. Your heart is full of wickedness. Your actions are horrible. (laughs) You are not doing what you said you are doing. Those are all action words if you look at it. Cease doing this. Learn to do this. Seek. Correct. Bring justice. Plead. Isn't that what James said in the New Testament? What's pure and undefiled religion? It's taking care of widows and orphans in their distress. You believe, you act. (laughs) You believe, you act, and you act with those who are downtrodden. God says you need to get rid of your evil deeds by replacing them with good deeds. I know in the New Covenant we're not saved by works. I understand that completely. And yet, the word of the Lord is, I've got works for you to do, go do it. Cease from doing these things, do this. And these people, they're they're doing all this stuff that that on the outside looks good, and yet inside they're a mess. And and then they're they're oppressing. Obviously, they're oppressing the fatherless. They're they're oppressing widows. They're not doing justice. They're they're doing evil, wicked deeds. All the while, they're pretending doing their feasts. I'm bringing my offering to you, Lord. I'm offering my bull to you. And then I'm going to go out and steal something from a widow. And God says, I don't want it. It's an abomination to me. Get your life to match what you say you believe. (laughs) I can't hear you because your actions are so loud. You ever heard that? (laughs) I can't hear your words because of what you're speaking to me or with your life. And you're saying, God, help us to be um, consistent. We're we're not left, though, there, which I'm grateful for. And throughout Isaiah, he does this. He gives them hope, and there is always hope for the people of God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Very familiar passage. Though your sins are like scarlet, and they were, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. It's a dearly loved visual. The contrast is so clear to me. They would make these dyes that that would be able to to get a deep red color, very deep red. But you could never get it white again. (laughs) If you messed up, if you spilled it somewhere, it would never be white. 
You could get it back to maybe a light pink of some sort, but you're never getting that out. And Isaiah's saying, the Lord is saying, come and let us reason together. Let us talk about this. Let us think through these things. How, how do we, in our day, go from deep red to white? How do we do that? Scripture's clear on that. We did it when we went through 1 John. If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. Isn't that what it says? Isn't that what it says? We can move from blood red sin to being snow white in the presence of God. Pure white in the presence of God. God is appealing to his people to think, to reason together, to choose properly. We have a choice. We can reject sin. We can reject rebellion. We can reject idols. We can reject the dark, foolish path to death, and we can choose life. That is throughout the scripture where he, where he says that to them. Choose life. Yeah. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. These guys have given themselves to idolatry, and he says, you're really going to serve Baal? After all I've done for you, serve the Lord. Amen. Totally, completely. God is willing. Now, this reason together is not a discussion between two equal parties arguing about a point. And we kind of misquote this sometimes. This is the one declaring the only possible solution for redemption. It's a one-sided thing. This is what you must do. Reason this out. You must repent. In the New Testament, we say it this way. John says it this way, and we agree with this. If, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us reason together about sin, God is saying. He said it in the Old Testament. He says it in the New Testament. Let's reason together about it. There's only one way to be done with sin, and it's in Jesus Christ. If you're in here today and you're bound up in a sin, there's only one way out. It's right here. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us our sins. You can move on. The people of Israel could. What, what are all these stories written down for in the Old Testament? If not to show us that we can change and God moves. God does move. When his people humble themselves and repent, God moves. Isaiah says it this way, If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by, you shall be eaten by the sword. <laughs> For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Life and death, freedom or bondage, forgiveness or slavery to sin, willing and obedient or refusing and rebelling, those lead us somewhere. They lead us somewhere in our day. If you're in here today and you adopt an attitude of rebelling against the authorities in your life, against God's law or His Word, and said, I don't care, you're heading somewhere. You're heading to death. The wages of sin is death. Isn't what the Scripture says? If we embrace our sin, in this particularly under the context of, of keeping a religious guise about us, wow, God have mercy. Jesus came and he got in the face of the Pharisees repeatedly. Why? Because they were pretending to be one thing and their heart was full of dead men's bones. Sin, wickedness. They were abusing widows. They're making long pretenses of prayer. They make sure they're dressed right, look right, act right, smell right. And in their heart, they were full of wickedness. And God said, repent. Jesus said, you guys, <laughs> you're like dead man's graves. You paint it white on the top, but it's still full of dead man's bones. And Isaiah has the same word back here. God says, I'm sick of your feasts. I'm sick of your festivals. It turns my stomach that you're doing this. <laughs> and you're going, whoa, God help me. And what, a, what a picture. You can eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you're going to be eaten by the sword. What a picture. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. And if we continue down that path in unrepentant sin, death awaits us. And the enemy is so sneaky because we get away with stuff for a time and we think judgment isn't coming or we think we're getting away with it. And we get hard to it and we continue going down something and God's reaching out to us and reaching out to us and he says, okay, I'm going to have to up the ante a little bit here to get your attention. 
And more and more things happen. And it's not always that way. I understand there's not always a cause and effect in those things. But if you've got willful sin in your life, the word of the Lord for you is to repent. And me, repent. Change what we're doing. I don't want to be eaten by a sword. (laughs) What a horrible picture. Fortunately, this section ends back where it began. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. God is the God who speaks to us. And he's speaking to us today. And and the the prophet, as that opening slide said, they present God as he is, not as we want him to be. God is the one who hated sin so much he sent his son to die for it. He sent his son to endure the cross for sin. It is brutal. And sometimes we wink at it. And sometimes we play with it. And sometimes we pet it. And we don't realize that it's poison, it's death, it's a sword, and it will kill us and everybody else around us. That's how bad it is. So the issue comes down to, for you and I in our day, will we choose repentance and life? Or will we continue to walk on in rebellion and darkness? And we all have varying degrees of this, don't we? Choices before us, we need to choose life. So here's how I want to think about some of these things and ask you some questions. And again, I'd encourage you to go back and read Isaiah as we go through this. But Isaiah had a vision from the God who speaks. So if you're in here today and you're going, well, how does God speak today? How does he speak today? I've not heard the audible voice of God. God has never said, yo, Jeff, stop. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard that. But I believe God speaks. How does he speak to you? Do you know the Lord's voice? Have you heard his voice? Do you hear it in the word of God? Kurt was talking about we need to be people of the word. That is so true. I need my mind renewed. And the way that happens is by being in the scripture. How do I know what's life and death? The scripture tells me. How do I know what's pleasing to the Lord? The scripture tells me. How do I know that I'm on the right path? The scripture tells me. If I get away from this, I'm in trouble. And I I find that if I drift, it's so much easier to drift further. And then it's easy to compromise. And then it's easy to end up in a mess. Most people who end up messing up their lives big time didn't get up one morning and decide to do that. They gradually made those choices and they shifted away. And the the way to change that is to gradually move back. (laughs) Repent and go a different direction. So how do you hear God's voice today? How about this one? How would thinking through our actions before they are taken help us? (laughs) How many times have people said, I wasn't thinking? Why did you do that? I don't know, I wasn't thinking. Okay, I'm not sure that that's an accurate sentence. (laughs) We just didn't think through it. It would be far better. It would be much better. And I'm talking to me. Slow to speak. (laughs) Quick to hear. And think through. Now, if I go down that path, where is that going to take me? If I start compromising, where am I going to end up? If I start getting accustomed to this, where is that going to go? And I understand you can get weird and you get into bondage and all that. But boy, we could avoid a lot of pain and heartache if we would just think before we acted. Just a thought. You read through this, what does God think of hypocrisy? What is, I, the prophet Isaiah speaking for God here is brutal, if you really heard it. It is brutal. And I read this and I'm thinking, God really is upset with hypocrisy. And so I internalize that and I start thinking, Lord, is there hypocrisy in my life? Are there things in my heart? that I'm presenting one thing but living another way. I mean, God, I need to think through these things. I don't want to have a confrontation with the Lord like the Pharisees did. (laughs) I, I pray you wouldn't either. But think about it. And where I'll end this today is what color dominates your life today? He lays it out pretty clear here. He says, let's reason together. If your sins are like scarlet, if they're red and deep and scarlet, how do you get them white as snow? How do you do that? And where are you today? Where am I today? Are you in here and you don't know the Lord? If you do not know the Lord, it's so deep and red, it's black, and it is death. You need to meet Jesus. 
You need to go to the cross and be forgiven and set free and get a new life in Him. If you don't know Him today, start there. If you do know Him today, if you're a believer and you've backslidden or you've, you've dropped away or you've compromised or you've done something that, that, that the Lord is speaking to you right this very moment and He says, that's what I'm talking about in your life, repent of it. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you feel far away from the Lord today because of the sin that's in your life, repent. God is waiting to forgive you. Don't go another moment. Just be done with it. Change your mind. Go a different direction. I have that on very good authority that that is true. That if you'll do that, He meets you. So, here's what I want to pray about this. Lord, I am very grateful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. You decided how this would all be taken care of, and I thank you for it. I thank you that we can run to the cross. We can plead the blood of Jesus over our hearts, our minds, our lives, our sins. We can be refreshed and renewed in you, that we can have a changed life and a changed heart. I thank you so much for it. God, I thank you that we can be born again. Let us reason together, you said. There's only one way, and it's through Jesus. There's only one way to be right with me, and it's through my Son. God, may we not ignore that today, no matter where we are. And God, I thank you that you are the God who speaks. Your word is clear. Your word still speaks to us today. Whether we're in the old or the new covenant, either way, you speak to your people. And I thank you for it, Lord. I pray you would take the things that were said today of you and put them deep into our heart and lives and let us take action. God, I thank you that today's a new day, that if we are alive at this moment, we have an opportunity. I pray we would not waste it. If there's changes that need to be made, I pray we would begin to do that and we'd run to you. We'd find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. And I thank you that even in the old covenant, there is tremendous hope for new life in you. Thank you so much for it. We know it's fulfilled in the, in the new, and I thank you for that, that we are people of the new covenant. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the food that we're going to stay and eat together here in just a little bit. Thank you so much for that, and all the hands that prepared it. And pray you'd bless our fellowship around the table, and that we could enjoy the life that we have, one with each other. So thank you for life. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for this day. Have your way in our lives, Father. We commit them to you. In Jesus' name, amen.